Uh, there's no Monday night football, so you're stuck with me and I'm stuck with me as well. Um, but this gives me a chance to talk about one of my favorite buildings in Los Angeles, uh, Union Station. And, oops, there we go. Uh, most of you know the first Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869 to Sacramento. And then shortly after that extended to Alameda and then to Oakland. Uh, the Southern Pacific reached LA in 1876. The Santa Fe would follow in 1885 and the Union Pacific in 1891. Uh, prior to 1939, each of the three railroads serving LA had their own passenger stations on the east side of downtown adjacent to their main lines and the LA River. The most prominent, most interesting station was the Grande station owned by the Santa Fe. <clears throat> Part of the issue that prompted uh, the development of, of Union Station was the fact that Southern Pacific's main line ran along Alameda Street. And as the number of cars in LA increased exponentially, the number of accidents between car and train did the same. So that promoted the notion that uh, something had to be done. So in 1926, this question appeared on the LA ballot. And I have to say parenthetically that this didn't have any association with a, uh, a bond issue or anything like that. It was simply a, an advisory item. But the question was, should Los Angeles build elevated train tracks or a union station? And the Los Angeles Times promoted the latter alternative in order to forever do away with Chinatown and its environment. Union Station was approved. Oops, sorry about that. So we might say something about urban renewal. In effect, this was the first urban renewal project in LA, although it wasn't formally described as that. Urban renewal is a process that involves officials declaring an area to be blighted because it was physically deteriorated or that the people living there, often people who are poor or of color, and that's often the unspoken motivation, should be moved out. So Chinatown, it's begun to develop in the latter part of the 19th century in an area that extended east from the original city plaza, which is the plaza today, uh, to near the banks of the Los Angeles River. On this map, there are a couple of things to, that we might point out here. In this direction is north, west. This is the Garnier block. We're gonna say more about that shortly. Uh, Aliso Street runs along the south side of the station today. This is, something's haywire here. And uh, Alameda Street runs in front of the station. The station occupied this area here. So due to alien land laws, the Chinese could not own land, but nonetheless were ghettoized in Chinatown, which include the infamous Calle de los Negros, the site of the first recorded race riot in LA. The Garnier block was built by a white developer, a Frenchman, to house Chinese businesses. Part of it still exists and houses the Chinese American Museum, which is adjacent to Alvera Street. During the, the 1930s, there was a development called China City in what today is New Chinatown, described as New Chinatown. And this was the brainchild of Christine Sterling, who was a developer of Alvera Street. And she used her contacts in the movie industry to build a kind of a movie set China City, uh, which by 1939 had been mostly destroyed by fires. But as the populate, Chinese population was forced from the Union Station site. Many settled in this new Chinatown location that exists north of Cesar Chavez Avenue between Hill and Broadway. And this area may be where some of you spent time in LA might recall that on Hill Street, there was the French hospital. The area of this new Chinatown was originally settled primarily by Italians and French. And the French hospital was literally a hospital for the French. Now it helps to 
understand the location of Union Station and many railroad stations in the United States, we understand a little bit about central place theory. And American cities tend to organize themselves in space in relationship to accessibility and land values. So historically, the central business district or what we call the CBD, not to be confused with the uh, marijuana derivative, has the functions that most people desire in a location that is most accessible to the most people. And consequently, this is where the highest land values would be found. In Los Angeles, up through uh, approximately 1950, the most accessible point or what was known as the peak value intersection was 7th and Broadway, which happened to be the location of Bullock's department store, the State Theater, and a number of other uh, high volume uh, activities. Rail transportation historically served the wholesale manufacturing district, which was adjacent to the CBD. And this is where our railroad passenger stations were built on the edge of the CBD. And we can see that here. Now, in 1939, the CBD of Los Angeles was nowhere near what it is today, but you can see the relationship here between the CBD and the station in the foreground. And you can also observe the buildings, particularly to the left here, uh, that are relatively short. And those are older warehouse and manufacturing structures that have been around quite a while. Uh, and that's typical, the CBD tends to be fairly tall and the wholesale district tends to be low for one and two stories, generally speaking. That's where the railroads served. That's where the stations were built. So Union Station opened in 1939. And at that time, it was known as Los Angeles Union Passenger Rail Terminal. And it was the last of the so-called great railroad terminals built in the United States. <clears throat> The architect was John Parkinson. And Parkinson, uh, this was his last commission. He died actually during construction. And he worked on this design with his son, Donald, and also architects representing the interests of the Southern Pacific, the Union Pacific, and the Santa Fe, who were the, actually the owners of the, of the uh, building. Something about Parkinson, he Built, he designed about 400 buildings during uh, the latter part of the 19th and early uh, 20th century. Uh, some of them are pretty well known. Uh, <clears throat> the Grand Central Market, Alexandria Hotel, Bullock's Wilshire, the campus of, Un of uh, USC, the list goes on and on and on. The guy was a tremendous uh, uh, producer. <clears throat> Now throughout his career, Parkinson demonstrated sensitivity to what were the popular styles of the day. And, and this was nicely illustrated by the Pacific Mutual building at Sixth and Olive in LA. On the left is the original building designed in 1908. It's the one in the foreground in the Beaux-Arts style by Parkinson and his partner at that time, Edwin Bergman. In 1930, Parkinson was asked to modernize the building and add retail space at the ground floor. So in partnership with his son, Donald, he sheathed the building in a streamlined modern shell. He only sheathed the two facades, the one on Olive and the one on Six. If you walk around the back of this building, you can still, still see the original Beaux-Arts uh, facade. But the point here is that he was sensitive to changes in style and his, his work tended to, to reflect that. Uh, eventually, there were three other buildings built on the site, none of them designed by Parkinson. Uh, the company then moved to Newport and they're known as Pacific Life now. They're the ones with a whale in their, in their ads. <clears throat> so when Parkinson was hired to design Union Station, he was very aware of styles that were popular in the 1930s. These included Mission Revival. There are some who say, and I don't know, I have no record that he said it, but supposedly some of his work here uh, in terms of the Mission Revival style was based on the uh, Santa Barbara County Civic Center, which is also the same style. I, I kind of doubt that, but it's an interesting connection at least. Also Streamline Modern which is characterized by a strong verticality and, and simple lines of, of the design. And, and as I noted, 
with the uh, Pacific Mutual Building. This was also known as WPA Modern because it was a popular style during uh, the 30s and 40s and often used in buildings that the WPA designed under the New Deal. And finally, Art Deco, which in this case is represented by the entrance to the station, this highly decorative, uh, decorated uh, facade. And then I, I would point out in the foreground, you can see a star, which is a Moorish star. And that is a, a theme that's repeated not only inside of the station, but in the MTA building, which we'll talk about a little later um, in its design. A couple of pictures of the station, one under construction and another one shortly after its completion. The building is reinforced concrete in, through entirely. And to kind of get us oriented as to what we're going to talk about today, um, <clears throat> we'll start out in the ticket office here. We'll go to the restaurant over here, the south patio, the waiting room, the north patio, and then the train concourse where passengers checked in and then went through a tunnel, which still exists, of course, out to the tracks that ran above the tunnel. A couple other things to point out. Sometimes you get a question about the Pacific Electric and the uh, LA Street Railway, which were the dominant, uh, inter well, Pacific Electric was, a, was a, an urban train and the LA Street Ra Railway oper operated mostly within LA uh, proper. Uh, I read on in Wikipedia that the Pacific Electric provided trans, uh, excuse me, passenger transportation to Union Station. That's not true. They only uh, provided rail, uh, uh, railroad express or or freight uh, movement. But they always and they had a they had a connection over here with the railroad express office. But the LA Street Railway, the yellow cars as they were known because the Pacific Electric with the red cars, did have a loop here and had passenger operations in the, uh, in the station. This is the ticket concourse. Uh, the original ticketing windows are over here on the right of the building, as you can see on the right side of the room, I should say. And they are solid walnut and they were divided into three sections. The Southern Pacific had the section closest to us and then the uh, Santa Fe, and then at the far end was Union Pacific. And passengers would come in these doors, and there was seating at the time here, and they purchased their tickets, and then they would follow this carpet, as Parkinson described it, to the uh, information booth, which was in the entrance to the station, then through the waiting room into the area where they would enter the trains. The ceilings are rather interesting here. We always, people who visit here assume that this is all wood. In fact, it's all concrete painted to look like wood. The uh, light fixtures are different in each room, although at first glance, they appear to be the same. And the largest ones, which we'll see in the waiting room, weigh about 1,500 pounds a piece. Now, 2021 Oscars were held at Union Station. Some people complained because the Union Station was effectively shut down, or at least the, uh, all the, most of the public areas for the event. But these two pictures show the ticketing area prepared for the uh, Oscars. Quite a transformation. In case you were wondering if you'd like to rent the space, uh, the rentals here run anywhere from, for depending on the room or the space, anywhere from six to $20,000 a day. Uh, this is the waiting room. <clears throat> One of the things that's been, that have been added or among the things that have been added in recent years are various kiosks that sell uh, various kinds of things. Uh, and again, you can see that carpet uh, that heads back to the trains. The seating here is original. It, it's been refurbished. Uh, you'll note the, uh, the area is cordoned off. The security people here make sure that only people with tickets sit here. They roust anyone else. Uh, you probably conclude why that's the case. Uh, <clears throat> a 
Now, the Southern, excuse me, the, the Santa Fe Railroad and Fred Harvey, who was an immigrant from England uh, and operated a restaurant in Kansas, uh, developed a relationship uh, prior to the end of the 19th century uh, to supply the, the Santa Fe construction crews uh, with food uh, as they worked their way across the country. Then that relationship evolved into the operation of hotels and also restaurants, which were referred to as Harvey houses. And among other things, they were, the restaurants specifically, uh, were uh, noteworthy for their so-called Harvey girls who uh, wore starched uniforms. They served good food at a reasonable price. And at each location where they had a restaurant, they also had a dormitory for, the, for these girls uh, with a house mother, not unlike a sorority. The thing that strikes me about the picture on the right are the, are the cigar boxes there in the glass counter. <clears throat> this part of the building, this interior was designed by Mary Coulter, who I think we could say was one of two prominent female architects in the first half of the 20th century the other being Julia Morgan. Uh, she, Mary Coulter operated mostly in the Southwest. Uh, she did a lot of work at Grand Canyon uh, and also built hotels, probably the most prominent of which is La Fonda in Santa Fe, um, <clears throat> and used Southwestern themes as well as Art Deco elements in her construction. In this particular room, the, art, the light fixtures are very similar, interestingly enough, to ones in a restaurant in Budapest, Hungary. The floor is, in her view, represents a Navajo rug or a Navajo blanket. In, in this picture, it looks like the floor is stepped, but actually it's flat. Um, it's just an optical illusion. After this was opened in 1939, uh, the war came along and the story is that with a lot of military people coming through here, they wanted to drink. So this cocktail lounge was added in what had been an alleyway adjacent to the restaurant. Uh, it now is referred to as the Streamliner Lounge. It's like, this is original. And it, it's a classic example of what's called Streamline Modern Architecture. Now in 1984, Santa, or in the 1980s, I should say, Santa Fe and Southern Pacific attempted to merge. The merger was ultimately denied, but the two companies did merge their real estate operations in a new entity called Catellus Corporation, which still operates. This new firm actively managed Union Station and engaged in many upgrades and changes. And among these was the restoration of the building, of the, the station itself. On the, in, on the walls of the waiting room, the restaurant and the uh, ticketing area is acoustical tile. And I always thought it was cork, but it isn't. It's actually a compound of cement and other materials, no asbestos, fortunately, uh, and has been very effective. Originally, <clears throat> it looked like this. It had a kind of a honey color. But over time, it came to look like this. It was a dark, dirty brown. And the reason for that, because all the smoking in the place penetrated these tiles, which are about two inches thick, as deeply as an inch. And what it was involved in restoring these things was cleaning them, almost like the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel, uh, or, and or replacing some of the tiles that were damaged or, or uh, even missing. Another thing that Catellus did was to develop the perimeter of the property to create cash flow. One of the things, one of the buildings that they developed was the headquarters of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California in a Neo Art Deco style. You can see the strong vertical component, similar to the uh, streamlined modern pillars or light fixtures, I should say, in the south patio here. In the courtyard, in front of the MWD building is a brick, a line of bricks, which I've pointed out here, 
which is the, was the southern boundary of Chinatown before it was wiped out. Now, in addition, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, or the Metro as, as it's known, built their office building here as well on the north, excuse me, on the east side, northeast side actually of the station. Again, strong vertical component to tie in with the station itself. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the lobby, but that Moorish star that I pointed out at the entrance is repeated in the floor of the lobby here. The light fixtures are very similar to the ones in the station as well. So it was a real conscious effort to tie this building in architecturally uh, with the station. And then the third structure that was built on the perimeter was the mosaic apartments, which are at the northwest uh, corner of the property. And finally, Catellus supervised the construction of what's known as Union Station East, which was an addition on the east side of the station that you see here, the exterior and the top picture and the interior and the lower two pictures. This was done in conjunction with the development of the red and purple line subway lines. Uh, and it also added two additional tracks to the operation above. So, so for a total of 18 tracks in uh, entering the station. In the lower left is the entrance to the older part of the station and an example of the artwork that's in this uh, development. The city of Los Angeles requires new construction in the downtown area to allocate a minimum of 1% of the total construction cost to public art. And this is an example uh, representing the diversity of Los Angeles' population. Over on the right here is a sculpture called Gold Mountain. The Chinese referred to California as Gold Mountain when they came here during the gold rush. And this represents that. When the excavations were done for this building, a lot of artifacts from Chinatown were recovered. And a lot of those then were integrated into this representation of Gold Mountain. There's also a water course that extends away from it that is supposed to represent the LA River and it sometimes probably has more water than the river itself. There's also an aquarium, don't ask. I have no idea why there's an aquarium as part of the work in this area, but it's there. In 2011, the MTA or Metro purchased the station and continued the work that Catullus had begun. I might point out to see the tile floors. These are original. Talk about durable uh, construction. Uh, considering the station is 82 years old this year, uh, it is absolutely amazing. There have been some repairs and they've been sensitive repairs, but basically these are the originals. Uh, on the upper right, you can see the tunnel that extends under the tracks. And in the lower right, uh, in the area where you enter the trains, several uh, retail operations, Starbucks, as you can see, Wetzel's Pretzels, which is real popular, and a, and a small general store have been included. And there are other commercial activities or retail activities in other parts of the station as well uh, that uh, certainly encourage and serve the increased number of passengers who pass through this station today. So some of the things that uh, Metro has done, they added air conditioning to the building, which did not have air conditioning originally, restored the Harvey house. Uh, it was in kind of bad shape. There was a, a fancy clock at the, in the back wall of the building that had disappeared. They, it was actually recreated. The lighting was restored. In the entire station, the lighting has been upgraded to LED uh, lights. They plan to upgrade and expand the restrooms. I would have hoped they'd be, that would be one of the first things they did, had done, but they didn't. Uh, continued restoration of the station itself, a repair and restoration of the Southern Arcade that runs in front of the uh, Metropolitan Water District building. Uh, it was damaged in an arson fire several years ago and it has been beautifully restored. Upgraded signage, 
including for the visually impaired, which we'll speak to, and celebration of the unions of the station's uh, 75th anniversary, which was a very, was a very elaborate affair. Now, the, <clears throat> among the enhancements for the visually impaired, which I'm kind of sensitive to since I'm head of what's known as the Itis Foundation, which serves the visually impaired and the blind in the San Gabriel Valley, um, this so-called Netherlands system, which was developed in Spain, uses specialized QR codes that can be read from about 40 feet away and which provide detailed instructions to a cell phone. Now, obviously with, in this example where the instructions are written out, wouldn't be real helpful to a blind person, but they also have an audible component as well. Another area that Metro has focused on is the North patio. It shows it in normal times, uh, the fountain on the north side of the patio, and then the same area during the Oscars. So what serves Metro or serves uh, Union Station today? The Metro red and purple subways, which were completed in 1993, at least from the station. The purple line is in the process of being extended as we speak. Uh, Metro Gold Line, which runs from East Los Angeles to Azusa and soon to Pomona. Uh, Metrolink in 1991, and of course Amtrak, which took over the operations of uh, the passenger railroads. So in 1939, when the station opened, it was handling about 7,000 passengers a day. Uh, during World War II, and the picture over on the left here shows uh, a crowd heading to the trains in, in uh, 1943. Uh, during the war, they had the passengers, the station, I should say, handled about a million passengers a year and 100 trains a day. In 1971, that number was down to 18. I can speak from experience when I first came to Los Angeles or to La Puente, where I taught. In 1969, there was another geographer who had been hired the year before he was from Kansas. And so he and I did field trips every Saturday. And one of them was down to Union Station. I can attest to the fact in the fall of 1969 that there were, were more pigeons in the waiting room than there were people. It was pretty sad. And the station was in fairly bad shape, broken windows and so on. By 2010, the passenger load was up to about 70, 75,000, 2014, about 100,000 a day. And in 2021, and passenger numbers have dropped off because of COVID, but Amtrak operates about 46 trains a day, Metrolink 60, and the gold line and red line, which would also include the purple line, 100 trains a day. So there's a heck of a lot more activity there than there was uh, 40 years ago. So <clears throat> bottom line, Union Station has experienced a revival in the last 40 years. There's a proposal that extends some of these tracks across the 101 freeway. This picture is an older picture. It shows the construction of the gold line here and the gold line tracks do in fact cross over the 101. Um, but they, the idea is to extend, extend more of the tracks so the trains can run through. Right now they come in, most of the trains that come in here, with except the exception of the long distance trains are double-ended. The other the ones that are not have to back in the station to pull out. So you want to avoid something like this. And this is the Super Chief, 1940, brakes failed. This was the result. So, but it's a happening place now. There's a heck of a lot going on. And one of the coolest things that they've done in recent years is to put this upright piano in the waiting room and people come in here and, and play and it is really a neat experience, really fun. Uh, just one other thing I might point out in this picture on the lower right, you can see on the wall, those, those are loudspeakers. There are two of them in the waiting room and two of them in the restaurant, though the ones in the restaurant don't function any longer. But uh, a few years ago, they had a, an announcer here who was similar to the guy who does the NFL films. It was like the voice of God coming out of those things. It was quite an experience. So if you're interested in additional research, <clears throat> 
Uh, the classic book on Parkinson is Iconic Vision by Stephen G. Uh, he also did a video version of it as well. I, I think it's on YouTube. Uh, the Chinese Massacre, massacre the, the work that's specific to that uh, is the Chinatown War, uh, published in 2012. But also the shifting grounds of race deal with race issues, including the, the Chinatown situation, but other issues as well, including discrimination in Los Angeles theaters, uh, published in 2007. If you're interested in tours, uh, the Conservancy runs tours every Saturday at 11. You meet at the uh, information booth on the west side of the station, or the west end of the waiting room, actually. You must make reservations, and right now we're limiting tours to five people in each tour. If we have more than that, then usually we'll have two or more docents, depending. So, but that's why you must make reservations. I believe it's $20 for non-members and $10 for members. Metro also operates an art tour, not only of the station, but of many of their stations uh, in, on the subway lines, as well as Union Station. Right now, their tours are suspended, but um, hopefully they'll begin to operate again soon. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Me. Yes. Susie, people I think understand. you're a ringer. I, I understand. Uh, I did the tour of Union Station with LA Conservancy, and they said that when Chinatown was originally built, the Chinese had no right of land ownership. That's correct. And part of what they had to give the Chinese when they moved them to new Chinatown was the right to own land. Uh, no, not, there was, there's, not really, but there was a, things, there were events that kind of coincided because World War II came along and all of a sudden we were friendly with the Chinese, we were allies and the, the uh, alien land laws were repealed. Okay. It happened around the same time, within okay. about a year or so. So at least when they were moved out of their their oh, area, right? They were at least under one rule or another given the right to own the land. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, um, yeah. Also, the all the property that was in China, what uh, the land that was under this is under uh, Union Station now was all privately owned. So there wasn't any, and it wasn't wasn't obviously a government agency that was building the station. So the property owners that sold their land, they're probably delighted to sell it to the railroads. Right. Uh, got a good deal. But it, it, dis it dislocated the people that live there. Absolutely. Yeah. Businesses, residents, you name it. Yeah. My, yeah. My, my father, when he came to California with his family in the early 20s, and he was like 18 or 19 years old, he, he did a New Year's Eve trip to Chinatown. <laughs> We won't and, ask. <laughs> oh, he, he wouldn't even go with me in there to to do a lunch on Sunday. He was so terrified of his experience. He ended up in some of the Warrens down under the city, and I apparently it was yeah. Crazy. I think it was a pretty uh, rough area. Pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. They do have the museum there, and you can see a lot of stuff online too. If you just Look for the Chinese American Museum in LA, you know? Yeah. yeah. They, yeah and they it, have activities and stuff too. They do. Yeah. Art exhibits, all kinds of things. Yep. You know. Other questions, comments? You, oh, Steve, like, yeah, Steve you, me you mentioned um, that LA requires, like when people are building the 1% for public art, did the right. Union Station benefit from any of that money for public art? That's a great question. Yeah, the, the addition on the back did. It was built later. The station proper, no. Mm. Um, and uh, a good place to look for some examples of how this has been applied is it fifth and, and grand where the public library is 
and across the street, one bunker hill. When bunker when one bunker hill, which was originally at Edison headquarters, a developer bought that and they added uh, solariums. I guess you there's the building has setbacks and they added solariums on those and they also added a retail area at street level. When they did that, they had to produce art equal to 1% of whatever it costs to build those things. So if you go into the rotunda, there's an artwork there, which I can't describe, but that's your 1%. Um, and then across the street is the gas company building and there's a mural done by a well-known artist who I can't think, I wanna say caller, but that's not correct. Uh, but it's on the, the wall of the Pacific or what was Pacific Telephone building adjacent. That's the 1% for that building. So there are different ways it's been used. That's a great question though. Yeah. Uh, so, Steve, hi. A uh, wonderful presentation. I thought that was so interesting. Thank you. Um, at the beginning, I was, I was happy to see the uh, at Southern Pacific Daylight picture. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, one of those engines, the 4449, went on to, uh, to be the main engine that pulled the American Freedom Train around the right. country. That's and right. that engine is now in the Oregon Rail Heritage Center up in Portland, and they still run excursions on it. But it, it ran uh, several excursions in the 70s and 80s out of Los Angeles uh, at Union Station, which was really nostalgic. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> where was I going with that? Um, well, it's an interesting note. As a kid, I lived in Berkeley, and uh, we used to go down to the uh, um, railroad, Southern Pacific Station and watch the daylight and the other, those, they had those fantastically painted locomotives and trains. Pass they're gorgeous. It was really cool. Yeah. Oh, I know. I remember what I was going to say. You know, in the World War II exhibit in the uh, museum, our, our Historical Society Museum, um, there's things, excerpts from uh, Lillian Bidwell's diary. And, uh, and she wrote many times in her diary during those war years that she was taking the train because she was working up in uh, Ventura. She was actually a, a high school uh, counselor. And uh, she would take the train home every weekend to, to be with her parents, uh, oh. Rolf Bidwell, you know, in, in uh, Glendora. And uh -huh. she talked about during those war years about how oftentimes, you know, they would get bumped and she would be in Los Angeles. And how was she going to get from Los Angeles to, uh, to Glendora? And, you know, it was just a real, a real trip during the war years. Because of the demand for seats, I guess, on the military. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to get to the museum and look at some of that stuff. <laughs> it was fun in the, in the 80s or 90s, and I can't remember exactly when, they pulled off one of the engines. 50, it was a steam engine, mm -hmm. and, and the uh, rail guys, the club, rehabbed it, and it did a trip from L.A., through San Bernardino up through the Tehachapi right. and back down again. Yeah, I've seen pictures of that. They My went... sister and I wrote it. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a total hoot. And, and when it came through the valley, it sounded, my brother said, I heard a phantom train today. Yeah, yeah I remember hearing it yeah, yeah. coming through here. It was great. Yeah, neat. Maybe we ought to organize a rail a rail trip for all of us. I'm game. You want me to you want me to drive it? I'll drive it. <laughs> <laughs> on second thought. <laughs> Not the train, the trip. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, a steam excursion would be cool. That would. Uh, it could. might be hard to find a steam train, but yeah, yeah. if if we got enough people, we might get Santa Fe to um, do a private trip for us. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the big boy, the Union Pacific locomotive that was over at the fairgrounds mm -hmm. has been, you know, they took it to Cheyenne, I guess is where the shops are. 
and it's been restored and they're using it for rail fan trips. And I read that just the other day. Did you go see it when it when they took it off uh, no, the Pomona Fairground? Yeah. Roy did. Yeah. He went and saw him take it off. I wish I had. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. yeah they, I know they put the tracks across the parking lot. There. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Great presentations. Yeah. yeah. Great. Just just Tamori was a docent over there at that uh, rail museum oh. at the fairgrounds for a long time. Yeah. Other questions, comments, positive ones, of course. But. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, well, I've enjoyed this. Oh, a Lord. question on the uh, LA Conservancy tour. Where did you say that it meets? Uh, at the information desk, just inside the entrance to the station on the west side. If you were at Alvera Street, let's say, and you walked across uh -huh. Alameda, you'd go in the station and it's right there. Go on the okay. Conservancy website and they'll have all the info and you can register there. Okay. And if you're lucky, you get me as a docent. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there are about four of us who do those tours. They're, they're a lot of fun. And they start at, uh, what did I put on here? 11 o'clock, I think, which is good. Because people like to take the tour and then go have lunch. Yeah. Well, and that's a civil hour. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the downtown tours are at 10 and yeah, 11 is better. <laughs> I, I, I recommend Steve's tours. I, I actually met my wife on one of Steve's tours. <laughs> hey, no guarantees. Yeah, no I guarantees, do, but you know. I can't do this for all of you women. <laughs> Although there's some old guys that go on these tours, probably have money, so maybe something will work out. Yeah, I, my, my odds are pretty good because everyone else is on the tour. But anyways. Yeah, then unfortunately, when they got married, we were, I think we were in Europe. And didn't get to go to the wedding. It was a real bummer. You would have thought they'd change the date, but no. We, we should have. You're right. <laughs> I think it was deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I think we thank Jim for another good program. Yes. And this guy is good. This guy is really good.